this is kind of a general course, but, and I added, we had kind of a short version of it. And I added a bunch of slides because it's kind of hard to talk about, about the distinctions between city, between town and village government. And we have a few slides that, and within the town government section, we have, uh, we discuss the different kinds of towns. So it's a little bit of a lesson in local government in New York. And if you want more information about that, we have a publication called the Local Government Handbook. It's really an online publication. We don't publish it anymore. It, it was a pretty extensive book uh, that was revised a few years ago and, and we just haven't printed it because it's it's a few hundred pages and most people just use it online. It's a good reference book, but I know a number of schools use it for their civics lessons and their New York state lessons. So it's a it's a great um, publication to uh, to check if you have, uh, interest in some of these issues. And I come to the um, I come to this approach, the my knowledge of local governments. I work for the Division of Local Government Services at the New York Department of State. And I studied urban and regional planning. And my goal as a planner was to save New York's rural areas, to kind of keep rural areas rural and revitalize city and village downtowns, but in the process of getting a job, I ended up learning a lot about our local governments. And so uh, this is, I just kind of picked some of this information up by osmosis and we have a program called local government efficiency. And so we have a little bit of a bias toward sharing services and, and uh, so there's that perspective too. Um, that we we bring to it. So um, if there's anything that we go over in this course, I think I, I told Sarah we'd have about an hour tonight. And um, if if everybody's, we, we could go over a little bit. I think I have a, probably a slightly more than an hour's worth of material, but I'll work as hard as I can to get to finish in an hour. And then if there are questions, we can stay after a little bit, or you all can follow up if you have uh, questions for me or my colleagues. The last slide of the presentation, and I think Sarah has the a PDF of, of it, so she has the slides, and on the last slide is our phone number and general email address. So um, Sarah, if you haven't shared the PDF with everybody who signed up, um, maybe at some point during while we're speaking or 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 afterward uh, so that everybody has the slideshow that would be uh, great for great of you to share it with them yes so, I will. Yes. okay great thank you and um if if people have questions I guess you can you can type them into the q and a and Sarah you might that's what I I was going to say you might be able to help me with those uh, sure. If the question comes in, you can stop me at any point and we can we can address it because we have a small group. That's one of the advantages of a small group. We don't have to be terribly formal. Um, we don't have to hold all the questions till the end. So um, just speak up if anything comes in and I'll uh, I'll try and pay some attention to the to the chat screen, too. It kind of goes away if I uh, if I let it. Uh, from on my screen. So just a quick overview of uh, what we're going to be discussing, qualifications for public officers, local officials. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about local government structure. We're going to spend a little more time on the roles and responsibilities of the different public officer titles. And then we'll wrap up with some ethics ethics questions, ethics discussion. And the uh, the photo here is a combined village town office in the North Country in the Adirondacks. Lake Placid and North Elba are good partners. They have a, a zoning law that really kind of functions as one municipality. 
and a combined planning board and zoning board of appeals that's made up of residents of both the town and the village. So the, the photo here is not an accident. It's the sort of thing that our office recommends local governments working together for uh, better services and greater efficiency. So who are local, who are public officers? They're obviously elected officials and those who are appointed as well. And our core audience in the local government training program are members of planning boards and zoning boards of appeals. They are public officers. And the municipal staff are, um, are also public officers. Um, so elect, other elected officials, we, we think of local governing board members primarily, but uh, municipal clerks, and then uh, your enforcement official, police officers are, uh, are all public officers. If you're em employed uh, or serve your municipality in some way, you are a public officer. And the qualifications for membership on a planning board, zoning board of appeals, or local governing board are uh, that you have to be at least 18 years of age. And so for most elected and appointed officials, uh, you can be a you can work for a local government and be younger than 18. Um, and, and not necessarily a resident of the municipality, but these are rules that apply to appointed and elected officials um, who serve on administrative boards, such as the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board and the Local Governing Board. Uh, you have to be at least 18 years old. Um, so they're not, they're not, it's not a huge hurdle. Citizenship, you have to be a United States citizen and live in the municipality. Now we there are examples of uh, exceptions that have been written into what's called Article Three exceptions. That's Article Three of Public Officers Law uh, for residency. If the local government can't find, and it's usually for employees of the municipality. If there's no one qualified to serve, for example, as municipal attorney or a code official, the local government can um, go to the state legislature, can, can ask for an exception to be passed. Now, the state legislature has done this for a lot of municipalities, and Article 3 of public officer's law goes on and on and on because there are all kinds of exceptions that the, the legislature has passed. And if once the legislature passes the uh, an exception for a town, for example, let's say the town of Colony to have to hire a municipal attorney who doesn't live in the town, um, that's then any town can can do the same. And the town of Colony, of course, is a huge town just west of of the city of Albany, so it's unlikely that the, the town of Colony would have trouble finding somebody in its 90 plus thousand population who could qualify uh, and would, would apply for the municipal attorney job, but small you can extend that to smaller towns and villages and um, those uh, municipalities, those smaller municipalities would, could certainly uh, be challenged sometimes in finding local officials uh, or finding qualified professionals to serve in certain municipal uh, positions. Now, I believe there can be the exception. I believe there are exceptions if you can't find members of your zoning board of appeals, for example. Uh, you can go, I think there are, uh, there is an exception. We, I was talking about this with one of my, uh, one of my new coworkers. And we always used to say, yeah, well, if you're, if, you, if you're a village and you can't find anybody to serve on your planning board, if you, you have a vacancy and there's nobody in the village who's uh, able and willing to serve, you can go outside the village, maybe to the town. That would be an exception. But uh, I could never find it. And I think she did last week. 
But if you're if you're having trouble finding somebody to serve on your village planning board or zoning board of appeals, as the case may be, we recommend considering having a shared, a, a combined, a joint village town planning board and joint village town zoning board of appeals. So the town and village would both uh, have appoint a certain number of members, maybe three from the bigger municipality and two from the smaller, for example. And there are even examples in the Tug Hill region of very rural towns that have five, have a cooperative zoning board of appeals in which there are five, there are two of these, uh, one in, I think, Northern Lewis and Jefferson County, uh, and the others in Southern Lewis and Oswego County. So there, there are five towns and there are five members of the Cooperative Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, one from each town. And the general municipal law is written in a way, in public officer's law, to give, to try to make it easy, mostly uh, general municipal law, to make it easy for local governments to do what they can do independently, cooperatively. So um, if you if you're look if you need that exception, you might before you go outside your municipality for one of your local officials, you should think about cooperating with another municipality. If it's for a municipal position, a professional in the municipality, then uh, chances are there is already an exception in Article 3 for the position. And we actually joke sometimes we feel like the, the code official should not be allowed to live in the municipality in which he or she enforces the uh, zoning and the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code because that person, it, it's very hard to say no to your neighbors. And I know the code official I worked with when I was a municipal planner didn't, he left his, he'd get into his truck on the weekend and drive straight out of the city because he didn't want to run into anybody. He didn't do any of his shopping or, or business in town because he didn't want to see people who would ask him or give him a hard time because he had to enforce the code on them or something like that. So sometimes being, not being a resident can be an advantage to doing your job, but most of the time you should be a resident of the municipality. And, and sorry to go on about that. So for so long, we, we always tend to. So once you're appointed, you uh, generally the uh, you you won't leave office until your term expires, or uh, you can see public officers law section thirty. The uh, vacancy is not created unless the um, the term ends, the incumbent dies, or fails to take an oath of office. And, and then, then, of course, there's res resignation covered in uh, the next section of public officer's law. And removal, which is very rare, we get calls at the Division of Local Government Services sometimes, and people will describe certain problems that they're having with maybe somebody who was elected and we always remind them that the power, their local officials have a good deal of authority and people, residents of, you should pay attention to who is running for town board and your village board of trustees, because it's very unusual for a court to remove a public officer, an elected or appointed official. Uh, most of the time, the that that person that public officer can be encouraged to resign or uh, serve out his or her term um, and occasionally we we talk about and I'll go to the slide the the oath of office has to be taken within 30 days of uh, of the start of the term so if a town board member is elected um, they they usually take their oath of office right at the beginning of the year and if uh, you're appointed to your planning board or zoning board of appeals, you should take the oath within 30 days because 
failure to take the oath within 30 days creates what's what's called a vacancy uh, in that office. And if um, your votes, if you didn't take the oath of office in January and here we are in March, you're still voting, your votes are, they count, they're not, they're not invalid. But if somebody realizes, somebody doesn't like you and realizes that you haven't taken your oath, you can, somebody else can be appointed in, in that position. You're, you're considered, uh, and if you stay, if you're reappointed and you don't take your, your oath, uh, or if you're not reappointed, you, you might be a holdover. Uh, if you're if you're serving a five year term and you go into your sixth year and you haven't been reappointed, you can still vote, but you're considered a holdover. And once you take that oath of office, you're good for the duration of your term. And um, but if you fail to take your oath, the appointing authority, the town board. Uh, or village mayor or city mayor, as the case may be, can appoint somebody in your place, and and there's nothing you can do about it if you haven't taken the oath. So um, so that's important. And so at the beginning of every term, local officials, appointed officials, and elected officials should take their oath of office. The um, so we're getting into local government structure here. The town board is the nucleus of the town. Um, what happens in the town? And it's the board. It's not the town supervisor. Sometimes the town supervisor is thought to have more power than the town supervisor really does, especially in larger towns. But the the town in the New York town is the town supervisor has limited ability to do things on his or her own. So it's the board. Uh, the town supervisor is has administrative responsibilities, but the town board is really the legislative authority there. And uh, you see the, the various functions that the town board has overseeing financial um, business, the permitting and keeping of records, appointing members to the planning board and zoning board of appeals, overseeing staff, the uh, including the assessor and tax collector. And then there's the dotted line to highway administration because most of the time um, the highway superintendent is elected. And so the highway superintendent is kind of independent from the town board. The town board is not the highway superintendent's boss, but the town board allocates funds to the highway department. And so there is some authority over, over that function, even though, and we always say, sometimes people call and they might complain about a local official, such as uh, a code official or a zoning uh, enforcement officer. Sometimes those those are often one in the same. It's the same person who enforces both the zoning and the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code. But occasionally, uh, local governments will share, or there's a the county will have uh, provide code enforcement, and each local government will have a a zoning enforcement officer. And sometimes we'll get a call about that enforcement official. And we always say the first thing you should do is go to your town board because the town board is that person's boss, not just the town supervisor, but the entire town board. And, um, but we can't say that with the highway superintendent. We don't get calls often about highway superintendents, but the town board does uh, have the power of the purse as it were. So some of the legislative powers that the town board has, uh, it's the legislative body. And um, the two things that are really most, uh, or I should say three, that the town board, the, the three municipal functions that are most significant are the allocation of a budget, the maintenance of municipal property, and the designation of land uses. 
So those those towns that don't have zoning, um, or, or for that matter, and, and there are not many that don't have any land use uh, powers. There are a few out there, but um, and and when I say land use powers, I'm I'm referring to subdivision uh, regulations and site plan, which um, local governments can adopt without having zoning. Um, zoning and um, the administration of a land use program are some of the most significant responsibilities that local governing board members have. And that goes for city council members, village board members of boards of village boards of trustees and town board members. So if if you don't have that function, no matter what municipality kind of municipality you're in, and it was uh, the city, the mayor of the city of Albany, upon a launch of a new zoning um, revision, uh, made that announcement, and and it made it it really struck a nerve with me because I I've always had that thought, but I've never had heard it articulated in quite the way she did. She said one of the most significant things we can do as local officials is determine the use of the land within our borders. And so that is a very important function. And then you have the financial function and just caring for the property uh, of the town. So um, that's, while I've been talking, you've probably read down both columns here, um, the, the functions, the legislative functions of, uh, of the town board and the, um, protecting the, the public health, safety, and welfare in a really general sense. And I won't read all the bullets on these pages because you probably already have. And as questions come up, we can, we can discuss those. But as I said, the town, the town supervisor has limited authority without, uh, without the collaborative work with the of the town board. Because the town board, the town supervisor is the presiding officer, in many ways, the, the CEO, the chief elected official, but really more of a presiding officer than an executive, um, more of a, an administrator than an executive. Um, and of course, the especially in smaller towns, the town supervisor is the chief fiscal officer. In larger towns, the town supervisor might oversee uh, somebody in a position um, that could be full time of, um, of of being the, the the fiscal officer, the controller. Uh, but the fund administering the funds, uh, overseeing. Uh, being this chief administrative officer is probably a more accurate description of the town supervisor than the chief um, than the chief elected official, because uh, the town supervisor doesn't have veto power. The town supervisor is a member of the town board with administrative responsibilities, and that's that's important to remember because. Uh, some of the towns in New York State, uh, we have 933 towns, so towns are the most numerous of any local government in New York. And, you know, I wonder what the, I don't know this off the top of my head, what the population breakdown is in New York, how many people live in cities, towns, and villages in total. Uh, there are 532 villages, so lots of villages, but many of them have small populations, and 62 cities, including New York City. So, um, well, there are 9 million people in New York City, so, and there are about 18 or 19 million people in the entire state. So cities probably have it, but there are, there are a few towns uh, on Long Island that if they were to become, and there's one village, uh, the village of Hempstead, I think the town of Hempstead is about 800,000 people. And the town of the village of Hempstead would be one of the biggest cities if it became a city. And the, the town of North Hempstead, there are only three towns in Nassau County, I believe. Um, Hempstead, North Hempstead, and there's one more that I'm forgetting. And they have lots of villages in them. But both Hempsteads have hundreds of thousands of people. 
they're bigger than most cities in in the state. So what's happened is the the state has a, a long history and town government kind of dates back. It's a it's like a 16th or 17th century model of local government, 17th century uh, or eight, it really 18th century, but it's based on uh, those town towns in 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 Europe. Um, the state was in, town government pre, predates the state of New York, um, and so uh, and and town government is is a real 18th century model, and it's evolved some. But we often hear from local officials who really study this stuff. If we were to reinvent the state, if we were to designate New York local governments today, we wouldn't do it this way. So towns are, uh, when the state was formed in 1787, towns were had a very different role in through the 19th century and into the 20th century, towns were generally rural places and cities were where the uh, population was, but over the course, especially in the late 20th and early 21st century, lots of people have moved out of cities. New York cities have not annexed land as cities in many other states that were founded later, that were established later, are able to do. So towns, people moved out of cities into towns and towns have become an increasingly dominant form of local government. So the deputy town supervisor is also somewhat of an administrator, usually for the larger towns. Uh, the deputy supervisor is, appointment, is, is appointed by the supervisor, not by the town board, although the town board has to establish the position. And the deputy supervisor can substitute for the supervisor, but can't vote in the supervisor's absence unless he or she is a member of the town board. So the deputy supervisor can be somebody who's not on the town board, but that person can't vote in the absence of a supervisor if of the supervisor if that person is not on the town board. Um, and obviously, and and in arguably is not voting in the absence of the town supervisor anyway, because if that person is a member of the town board, that person is voting in his or her own position on the town board. But in the absence of the town supervisor, whether on the board or not, has uh, an organizational role for town town board meetings. The town clerk is the chief records officer of the of the town and serves as a secretary at town board meetings and um i just wanted to check my notes i want to make sure i'm not forgetting um yeah state records officer and um is often um, we we just had a meeting with our counterparts in the state archives, and they work closely with town clerks um, on um, on records grants. The the state archives has very generous grant funding for records management, and municipal clerks are the records officers for local governments. And so they're the points of contact with those, with that program. And um, we, there are, uh, the town clerk usually collects taxes. Sometimes there's the um, tax receiver, or collector of taxes. Uh, it's a different position, but generally that's under the town clerk. And, um, the uh, the Department of State is in many respects the the clerk of the state of New York. It's where the records for the state are kept. It's where local laws are filed, but also state laws. Uh, the the Secretary of State is the the keeper of the state rec the state's records. So uh, we, although our division has a, a not that function. Uh, exactly. We assist local governments. That's where we're housed. 
and we have that in common with uh, with town clerks. Uh, most of the time, town clerks are elected, and there are a few. And I attached, I, I found a survey of elected and appointed town officials, and it was done by the town of Bethlehem. And I attached it, or I appended it to the handout of the slides. It's kind of an interesting read, and um, I in the survey they took most clerks they found were, uh, and this is just something I've never thought to do until today. So I went to see if somebody else had done it. Most clerks are in fact elected, although there are some appointed town clerks and we'll get into the advantage of elected or the, the, the debate over elected versus appointed. Uh, officials a little later because we'll talk about some other positions. I talked about highway superintendents. There are some highway superintendents who are appointed, but many are elected. I think everybody, uh, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time on the uh, um, on, on this position. I think everybody knows and values the work of their highway superintendents and staffs. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these public officers either. They're fairly self-explanatory. The uh, most towns, I, I, I think every town, every local government has a municipal attorney. They might not work for the municipality full time. Some of them for smaller municipalities are very part time, but it's larger municipalities that would have a director of purchasing and, and town controllers. But and this is this is an example of and and you see under the town controller town of the first class or more than forty thousand people uh, in population. The uh, um, towns of the first class because New York evolved towns evolved and some of them are um, and there's a great paper by the controller's office I think it's about twenty. 20 years old or even older at this point. And, and it's all about how, uh, if we were doing it today, we wouldn't do it like this. And it's about how there are, New York's local government designations are, are almost irrelevant because there are many very rural towns, some big suburban towns that have rural areas still, but are, are mostly urbanized or largely urbanized and then there are some very urbanized towns and they are all treated fairly alike although in the 20th century there was a distinction given to suburban towns and towns of the first class and then every other town i believe is a town of the second class and there are distinctions that i'm not going to get into here if you want to read up on that i can i can give you homework assignments in the local government handbook and, and other publications, including town law. Um, uh, other public officers, uh, the assessor, everybody has that, and the board of assessment review, here's challenges to assessments, and the tax collector or receiver of taxes, those are other positions, uh, also sometimes handled by the town clerk. Um, some local governments are really challenged in this way because a couple times a year, uh, or really for local governments, once a year, we pay taxes twice a year, sometimes to school districts and our, our local taxes. Um, but the um, there are a couple times a year, the clerk gets very busy, the, the receiver of taxes gets, gets very busy. So um, we, we've heard stories of how sometimes that position of receiver of taxes is a temporary position somebody's borrowed from another office in town. Sometimes it's a temporary position that's uh, that's more or less seasonal uh, because the town clerk, uh, if it's a solo town clerk, can't necessarily handle um, all of that extra work. And other public officers, as uh, as you can imagine, are those you're familiar with engineers, the enforcement officials. You might not, not many towns, especially the smaller ones, I would say they're probably, if I had to guess, 50 towns that might have a planning department. 
And um, those are the, the bigger towns, obviously, the, the larger suburban and, and more urbanized towns downstate. And, uh, and then, then board members, members of the planning board, zoning board of appeals. Sometimes there, there are other special boards, um, such as conservation advisory councils and um, uh, agricultural, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the acronym now, um, but um, the, the, the conservation board that advises for the protection of farmland at the local level. And then um, towns have special districts because what's happened, cities and villages kind of are all in one local governments with lots of services. And what happened in town, towns over the years is people moved out of villages and cities and then said, oh, well, we want streetlights. We want garbage pickup. We want... Um, Sometimes we they they wanted obviously fire protection and um, and sometimes police forces and and then sometimes sewer and water and so they ended up uh, over time evolved uh, special districts formed to provide those services to towns and only those residents who benefit from them pay into those special districts they pay that special assessment. And so there are lots of special districts in New York. We um, sometimes joke, sometimes villages that uh, have declined in population and there's nobody left to run for office, the village will, uh, or they're having trouble finding people to run for office. And we've had a number of villages dissolve over the years. A village might dissolve, but then a number of special districts have to form to provide the services that the village once did. So you lose one local government and others are created, but it's not exactly the same. So uh, I think probably everybody, if they're especially if they're local officials on this webinar, understand the town and village relationship that villages exist within towns, although there's some that exist uh, within multiple towns, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but towns can't govern what goes on in a village, and village can't villages can't govern what goes on out in the town outside the village. But interestingly, uh, and residents of the village generally serve on village boards, and residents of the village or the town outside the village can serve on town. Board. So, and you can have a member of the village board of trustees who serves on the town planning board. And those offices are not incompatible because it's those are different entities. They're lo different local government entities, and they wouldn't um, ever come into conflict. You wouldn't, you don't have somebody serving in two off two offices that work toward the same end that that have the same um the same responsibility so if somebody is is on two boards in, in a village and in a town um it's it's not an incompatibility of office we get questions like that often about whether people can serve in in that capacity and those are kind of fun because they, they're they sometimes academic. We don't necessarily look them up, but we can consider them. And then there are places where we look for incompatibility of office too. We'll talk about that a little incompatibility of office later in the, um, in the program toward the end. So just a few uh, fun facts about villages. Uh, it was the term was first used um, in state law, I guess Waterford was the first village. I think um, Waterford claims Waterford is in southern Saratoga County, north of Albany, just over the Albany Saratoga County line. And there are signs all over the place that say that Waterford is New York's oldest village. And that doesn't mean that it was the first settled village, although I think it was settled quite a while ago, but it was the first village that it was established. And um, the 
I don't know if it's still 12 that operate under charters uh, because some of these, I just updated a few of these today. And one of them in your handouts, I, I just realized I uh, I changed it. It's it's actually, um, is it correct here? Maybe maybe not. Um, there, there are 533 villages in New York State as of this month um, or as of early this year. One will... Um, one will dissolve at the end of the year, and I'm trying to remember which one it is. Um, South Nyack was the last village to dissolve at the end of 2022, and I um, it might come to me. I should know this. Most of them have a pretty small population. Almost 70, 69 villages are located in two or more towns and six are located in two counties. This is what uh, has changed there. I think there's 68 that are in two or more towns and five that are lo located in two counties because I found somewhere in this course that the village of Keysville was about to dissolve it had, when uh, the course was, a lot of work was done on this course and the village of Keysville has has dissolved, did dissolve a few years ago. And that was one of the villages that was located in two counties. Saranac Lake is unique in that it is, it, it has, it takes three towns and two counties, Essex and Franklin counties. And I couldn't tell you the three towns. Um, I uh, yeah that that one that's a that's another trivia question and of course Saranac Lake calls itself the city in the Adirondacks because villages really have an urban quality and Saranac Lake does it's one of the largest villages if not the largest village in the in the Adirondack Park and it has a a city quality it probably has a greater a population that's greater than a couple of the smallest cities but it is technically a village. And there are five villages, um, Harrison and Scarsdale are among them. Green Island, I think is one in the capital district in Albany County. And I can't remember the other two. Um, Coterminous villages, uh, I'm actually kind of surprised there are not a few more of those because they are, the, the advantage of a coterminous village, it kind of, seems kind of silly to, to not, because you've got two governments technically, but when you have a coterminous village, the municipality functions as a village with the mayor, with an executive, in a more in a what in a form that is the the village form of government is really a little more contemporary than the New York town. So um, there are a few villages that have gone that way. Some are studying it rather than dissolving. There are towns that have just agreed that they should function with an executive and um, have some of the advantages that, that the village form of government in New York State has. There are still villages that incorporate once in a while. We had a question recently about one. Um, and most of the time, it's about it's it's about a zoning controversy that villages form. Um, if a group of citizens wants the zoning in a certain area to be different than the town has designated it, we had a notable case uh, in, a few years ago in the uh, in Rensselaer County, just outside, just east of Albany, where at the intersection of two, well, a U.S. highway and a state highway, an exit right off the interstate, there was land that was uh, zoned residential and it hadn't developed and some developers bought it and they wanted to rezone it commercial because they saw the potential of the value of this land for commercial development at the intersection of two pretty prominent state highways right off of an interstate highway ramp. And the people who lived near it tried to form a village and they couldn't quite pull it off. They didn't have the 500 um, inhabitants to form that village. You need to have five square miles 
and you can't already be part of a city or a village and you need 500 inhabitants. So they, they do form every now and then, and it's usually in response to a zoning controversy. And small villages, of course, might only have a few, a few uh, employees uh, that provide basic services, but larger villages are function kind of like cities, kind of like smaller and sometimes mid-sized cities. But most are somewhere in between with a number of, of legacy functions and uh, staffs of of uh, 22 uh, to 50 to 100 or so. The village board of trustees is made up of the mayor and four trustees. The village mayor doesn't have quite the authority that city mayors do, but uh, arguably has a little more authority than the, uh, um, than the town supervisor, than most town supervisors. Most are elected for only two year terms and they have all of the uh, authority to, um, as town board members, to uh, enact legislation and uh, manage their affairs. And notably, uh, among those legislative functions is uh, zoning and other land use uh, regulation, site plan review and subdivision. Interestingly, I've come across a number of villages that don't have subdivision regulations because they're, they're mostly built out. So there's a greater percentage of villages that have zoning than towns, but some there are many more towns that have subdivision regulations than, than, than don't. Um, and some villages don't have subdivision regulations because most of them are, are pretty built out. So the village mayor votes to break ties and is the uh, something of an executive over the the affairs of the village. And I uh, I think everything else here is pretty self-explanatory. The deputy mayor, unlike the deputy supervisor, must be a trustee um, and is appointed by the mayor um, and acts uh, for the mayor, fills in for the mayor in the mayor's absence. The uh, And villages can sometimes have managers or administrators, which are more full-time. Uh, if the mayor is somewhat ceremonial and um, an and executive, the village manager runs the, the municipality in a, in a professional manner, in a, in a full-time way. Some, some villages need more time than others, and mayors can't necessarily leave their day jobs to work full time for their local government. So uh, some villages, uh, not a huge number, had uh, the last time we checked in, in 2007, 67 had professional managers or administrators. And the village clerk uh, very has a similar role to the town clerk, but is appointed. And um, for, for two-year terms and treasurers and clerk, clerks and treasurers. We often hear of, about the village clerk treasurers. They're often positions that are combined, especially in smaller villages. And, and then sometimes there's the independent treasurer who um, whose functions are um, financial in, in nature and um, issues, uh, handles payments and, and uh, collects uh, the um, the revenues of the of the village. The um, let me just make sure I didn't skip one here. Okay, um, the sources of legislative power in New York come from general municipal law, town law, village law, general city law, and municipal home rule law. I uh, um, will get oh, just a little bit into municipal home rule law, but these are the sources of authority and a lot of a great discretion, great authority has been granted from the state to its local governments. And traditionally cities had more power um, to write their destinies in their city charters and city charters kind of pre, they don't preempt exactly general city law, but they, um, they, um, um, 
um, what is the word I'm trying to think of? Um, they, they can be written in greater detail. General city law isn't as detailed as town law or village law. Charters are the give local governments the authority to have more control over the way they handle their affairs, I guess, for um, um, that's probably the best way to describe it. And, um, and I'm not, because we have many more towns than cities, and cities generally have staff, the uh, uh, I find myself not as familiar with general city law as I do with town law and village law. And generally, when we cite sections of statute, it's the it's town law and its equivalents. Municipal home rule law is um, was granted initially to cities in the form of their charters, where they could. Um, they could supersede, that's the, the word I'm, I was trying to think of a minute ago, they can supersede statute in almost every respect and, and uh, write, the, the charter is like the city's constitution. And some villages have charters, towns don't, but all can supersede now. Towns were given the ability in 1964 to supersede statute. Cities and villages had that authority initially. And over time, towns have, because they were the more powerful, they were where the populations were. And over time, town, towns got more powerful. And in 1964, were given the um, supersession uh, authority and uh, authorized in municipal home rule law to supersede most sections of statute. And I'm not a an attorney, so I can't explain this very well, but there's certain um, property affairs and government, there's certain aspects of property and affairs and government that municipal home rules law sections 10 and 11 um, give local governments. Not all, there are areas where the, uh, the legislature, the state legislature has explicitly and implicitly, and some of those areas have been revealed in uh, case law, occupied the field and taken, uh, taken control of their own affairs, uh, or the state has prevented local governments, I'm sorry, uh, from superseding statute and required them to go by um, statute as it's written in town law, village law, and general city law. And one example of that is the use variance and area variance test. And um, we can talk we can talk more about that if anybody has specific questions, and I can enlist the assistance of as of an attorney to uh, to to help me um, enlighten everybody about it. But that is. Um, that's really the, the gist of municipal home rule law. Um, the, the hierarchical hi hierarchy of local legislation is the local law at the top ordinance um, is a form of legislation, but it's lower than the local law. And resolutions are enactments that they're not legislative in nature. They are generally budgetary. They're they're legislated in the sense that the local governing board is acting. It's something that the local that needs the action of the local government to uh, accomplish a resolution, but it's not a form of law or legislation. And in New York, we have the local law, which we encourage. Villages don't have ordinance power anymore, and local laws are really the way local governments are going. Towns didn't have the local law authority until the 60s, municipal home rule law. Um, but uh, the, the advantage to the local law process is that your local laws are filed at the Department of State and they are seen as the equivalent of um, the, the, the state government enacting a law. So. Um, and the doctrine of legislative equivalency is 
says that if a, if you have a local law, it can't be amended by ordinance. You need to adopt, you need to um, and amend a, an existing law or ordinance by at least that level of authority or higher. So you can, if you have a zoning ordinance, you can amend it by local law, but if you have a zoning law, you can't convert it to an ordinance. And um, that's just a little, the most important thing to remember is that most municipalities are going by local law these days and there are advantages to that. The ordinance process is a little, a little clunkier um, so and we have a publication called Adopting Local Laws in New York State. We don't have one called Adopting Ordinances in New York State. So just a little bit about referenda in New York State. If the legislation, if the action is not authorized by referendum, you can't have a referendum to, um, to pass it. So zoning, you can't pass, you can't say we're gonna adopt zoning uh, based on a referendum because there isn't that authority in New York. You can take a, an informal survey, but and you can base your decision on the results of that survey, but you can't do it by referendum. The uh, generally, the, the mandatory referendum, which is spelled out in municipal home rule law section 23, uh, requires if a if a local government adopts a piece of legislation, it's required to be voted on by the public. And generally, the mandatory referendum pertains to a change in elected office. It's a, it's a change in the form of government. And usually the, the abolition, it's usually the one at the bottom there, the abolition of a, an elective office, moving from the appointed highway superintendent, clerk. Um, those are those are the main ones. Uh, tax uh, receiver of taxes to, uh, or moving from an elected clerk, highway superintendent, receiver of taxes to an appointed one, um, and the general advantage to having an appointed, those appointed professionals is the, your town board will oversee the professionalism of those appointed officials. And um, the advantage of the elected officials, the reason why a lot of uh, voters resist is because they feel that the highway superintendent is accountable to the voters and the clerk is accountable accountable to the voters. It's more democratic for the voters to, to choose those local officials directly. The problem is, how do we know what the qualifications, most of us, if we don't know them personally, the qualifications of the highway superintendent or the clerk, and I think we've all had those experiences where um, my current highway superintendent is very good. He's elected. And um, the I'm not sure uh, about, I know that my, my clerk is elected, but I'm not sure um, what the clerk's background was. And somebody told me a little bit about the two candidates for clerk, and it, it was even more difficult to research than it is members of the town board. So there's that challenge. Permissive referenda are uh, occur and it's a it's a it's a detailed process i'm not going to get into it uh the the details of it but the uh there can be a public vote by petition it's referendum on petition so the local government passes um the passes the law and the citizens voters have 45 days to petition for the question to appear on the ballot for voters to be um, for for it to go for the question of whether to enact the legislation to um, to go to voters and generally referenda by petition have um, are have to do with um, with spending money and I'm just realizing I'm running a little short on time so. 
Um, I'll I'll hurry up and and we'll we'll wrap up here. And we've lost a couple already. The um, administrative power it's creating land use boards um, and appoint appointing them and maintaining your regulations. And then we have ethics at the end here. And we have I have a couple friends at the uh, Association of Towns who do a great job in teaching ethics. And we can answer questions pretty well, uh, ethical questions. Um, they, um, but it's it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to teach. And there's some great um, case there's there are case reviews that I saw at the Association of Towns conference a few weeks ago um, that that were very good, and they kind of enforced my understanding of of ethics, but. The general problems in ethics have to do with um, how well look how well public officers are doing their job um, and the avoidance of misconduct, misconduct or malfeasance in office. And I think we all know it when we see it. Um, it's kind of hard to describe uh, all local governments. And I'm sorry, in your handouts, I just realized we have the same slide but different. Um, we have the same slide, but different um, photos here. And I actually, in my in my presentation, I brought brought up the wrong ones. These are the same same content, different photos. Um, local governments must have a code of ethics, but they don't necessarily have to have a local board of ethics. Your county has to have a board of ethics, and sometimes you can put questions to your board of ethics um, that might render a decision. About whether a certain public officer should behaving in a be behaving in a certain way, because um, ethics law is a little bit murky, and um, sometimes people complain they don't know really where to go, and there's no easy answer for dealing with ethics questions. Conflicts of interest are primar primarily concerned with whether there is financial interest by a local official or some kind of con conflict by family ties. And it's generally financial or whether somebody would, would be inclined to vote a certain way to benefit a close family member or, uh, or a friend. And if there is that financial co connection, then the local official should recuse him or herself from the vote. And an attorney general's opinion says that the local official should remove him or herself from the discussion uh, and, and even sometimes the room. And that, that's one that's argued about. But um, ideally, the person with the conflict of interest shouldn't have any influence. And sometimes that person's mere presence in the room, if he or she speaks, um, influences the rest of the board. And so a true recusal is removal from the decision-making table and the room. Um, abstention from voting, if somebody do just doesn't want to vote, that is, um, that's the equivalent to a no vote. And you shouldn't be abstaining just because you don't feel like voting or, um, and a true conflict of interest should really be financial. And I'll use a personal story here. I um, moved a lot line. I bought some property around my house and I moved my lot line. And I went to the planning board and all of a sudden I realized that I, there was only one of them I didn't know personally. One of them is a, is a local mechanic who'd done a little bit of work for me. Another one was the brother of, of the guy who did a lot of work on my house. Another one was the, the local oil uh, oil man who uh, I, I, I had propane heat, so I didn't go to him at the time. So, but I kind of knew him. And, um, and then one of them was a local realtor who brokered the deal of the sale of my land. She recused herself from the vote and I believe she acted appropriately. Um, she was very professional, she left the room. Now she hadn't, the deal was done. And so she didn't have uh, 
she she didn't stand to gain financially by the decision that was being made by the board because the land I'd already bought the land um and uh, so she acted appropriately because if she had voted there would have been a perception of impropriety so what she did was was really right even though arguably um it, it was really the right thing to do but those other people, they could have said, well, I know this guy, I worked on his car or um, my brother works for him. And um, if if I vote in one way or another, um, maybe my brother won't, maybe he won't hire my brother for, for the next job. In small towns, there's going to be people or there's going to be familiarity, but um, if there if there's truly a conflict of interest, it's when a member of a board stands to gain financially from a decision. Now, um, there was a question: Would changing party affiliation in the middle of the term create a reason for a removal from office? I wouldn't say so because removal from office is very um, is is very difficult. We've uh, we've looked into that with certain questions that that have come in with uh, ethical violations, and it's very rare for state supreme court to intervene in uh, local uh, affairs like that. So uh, the question of um, changing party affiliation in the middle of a term is um, is not a reason for um, removing somebody from office. Uh, but thanks for that question. And uh, then we'll we'll wrap up here with incompatibility uh, of office and a few others. Incompatibility of office is when um, you can't, there are certain offices that, um, dual offices that a local official might not be able to hold in general. Um, and there, there are uh, statutory, there are laws that specifically exempt, specifically preclude uh, the dual holding of offices. Members of local governing boards cannot serve on the planning board or zoning board of appeals. Um, that's explicitly stated in town law, village law, and general city law. Then there are common law tests where you can't be your own boss and you can't vote twice. So if you're on your local planning board and you're on the county planning board, you can't vote twice on the same application. Some county planning boards just say you can't vote in your on anything coming from your municipality. And um, and then there are sometimes it's not an incompatibility of office for somebody to serve in a small municipality. It's having trouble finding people to serve a husband and wife serving on one on the planning board, one on the zoning board of appeals, one on the local governing board, one on the planning board, um, or even the same person on the planning board and the zoning board of appeals, as long as that person doesn't vote twice. So if a site plan or subdivision application goes to the ZBA for uh, some dimensional relief, that person should either vote in his or her uh, capacity as planning board or zoning board member of zoning board of appeals, but not both. So um, just very that a very quick review of incompatibility of office. And we often take specific questions from people. Um, this is pretty straightforward. You can't take uh, gifts from local official from from members of the public. Um, that have more than a nominal <laughs> value. Um, larger municipalities have to complete financial disclosure statements that just pretty much lay out where their income is coming from, where their investments are to um, their public documents that prove that those people don't have a, confl a financial conflict of interest while in office. And local officials generally don't have to worry that they're going to get in trouble for their decisions if they are not egregious in nature. Um, most of the time, your local government has your back and has indemnification, um, has arrangements for indemnifying its local officials. If you didn't have that, and this is in 
uh, can be found in public officers law and general municipal law. Um, there'd be a lot of disincentive for local officials to, 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 to serve. And I think we have a few resources here and then we'll wrap up. So um, our counterpart at the Office of State Controller, the Division of Local Government at the Controller's Office uh, is at that link. Um, the Controller's Office addresses um, financial issues and, and management uh, more than our, our division is sharing and um, sharing services and planning uh, planning and land use re regulation, land use regulation, land use planning and, and regulation. Um, and then our friends at the Association of Towns uh, provide services. Um, these are member organizations that are uh, are also advocates for towns. And then the Conference of Mayors are uh, are are state advocates for villages and cities. And that does it. Uh, if you have questions, you can always call this number during regular business hours or email us anytime. And um, I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but I ended up with more material than I planned. So everybody should have an hour and 15 minutes of training credit rather than just an hour. So um, Sarah, are you still there? Yes, I am. Um, that was okay. a very good presentation. Thank you, Chris. Great. I hope so. I hope everybody got something out of it and uh, know that you are welcome to call us if you have specific questions or send us an email. And we'll look forward to seeing you, uh, you and others in Houghton in June. And Sarah, do you have anything uh, anything else to add in uh, in closing? Um, I just I emailed the handout to everyone. I need to follow up with um, the person who called in on the phone, um, Susan Feldman. I'm going to have to find her email, and um, the one at the top that says the clerk. I'm not sure who that is. Um, <laughs> So can you guys let me well, know? Maybe they quick? can email you. Yeah. I hope the person on the phone is uh is still listening. Okay, so I'll follow up and try to um get those out to you. If not, um the information, everything will be posted on the Southern Tier West website under um 2023 archive training. And I guess. That's all I have to say. And thanks again, Chris. You're welcome, Sarah. Thanks for hosting. Would you be able to stay on for a minute at the end? Oh, sure. Okay. I just want to ask you a few quick questions. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone.